Welcome to the Inner West Library Speaker Series. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Gadigal and Wongal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present, and emerging. Today our conversation will be with Vincent Sebastian. Vincent is a music producer, percussionist, DJ, and creative entrepreneur who leads innovative arts-based projects and events. He is the founder of the music group Ayobi, which creates polyrhythmic electronic music, and Zook, an online arts platform that initiates conversations with artists on diverse topics such as spirituality, culture, tradition, and art. He has performed with many prominent local and international musicians. Vincent demonstrates in conversation the process of the creation of Melody of Humanity, a cross-cultural and multilingual song and video created in conjunction with the Inner West Council. Welcome, Vincent. Hello. Thank you for the introduction. No worries. What was the inspiration and the influences behind the Melody of Humanity? How did you conceptualize it? So the way that started is we, well, I've got, I got approached from the people at SSI and the Refugee Welcome Center, Laura Luna and Munez Mansubi, and they wanted to collaborate with me and the studio that I um, co-managed, The Nest, in the creation of a project, an idea that they had at the time, which was the creation of a song that was going to be created fundamentally by 22 artists from different countries. We have everything from amateurs who had never performed before to professionals who were used to performing regularly in their in their own countries. Not only did we have to put together a song where everyone contributed musically, but that they had to be featured in some sort of way. So this brought a bit of a, a new complexity to it because considering that there were all different musical levels, we had to find a way to feature each, each artist at the same time collaborate with each other and also in the creation of something new. The idea was to somehow bring all their styles together with some sort of common thread. And so that was the idea behind it. That kind of leads into my next question with the mm. 22 different artists that you've collaborated with. What was it like, for, they're all from very different cultural backgrounds as well. What was it like collaborating on such a scale? Yeah, it was challenging. It was definitely challenging. We hadn't, um, when I say we, I'll, I'll actually, I'll, I'll mention, I, I originally got for this project another facilitator who was Adam Ventura, who's one of my um, longtime musical collaborators. He's an amazing songwriter and bass player and in his own right. And he, he it was basically me and him who facilitated this this session. So the session was challenging because... We had a limited time frame to record everyone. Obviously, there was 22 artists, and we had to, you know, basically most of them were from out. I don't think any of them for in from the inner city where we have the studio. So we had to collaborate a lot of people to come in and record, working around the studio times in terms of our times as well. So that was a bit of a challenging thing. In the end, what we ended up doing was we organized two days of recording on a weekend. So we had a whole eight hours on a Saturday and then a Sunday. And if you can imagine the 22 artists, it's not actually a lot of time. We, we sort of organized these 22 days, had a whole roster. We basically organized the first day being an instrumental day. So the idea that we had for the first day was that everyone that played instruments, we were gonna get them to come in. And we sort of started with, with maybe the most professional um, were the ones that, that said to us that they were professional musicians. We sort of started with them and then worked our way down through the intro instrumentalists. And the idea was that we'd get them to come in, do a session of about five to six players for three hours in the morning, and that would establish some sort of idea. What that idea was, we were really unsure of. So for me, the role was about getting the studio ready, having mics ready, getting all the instruments in the studio ready to record and then getting all these people in and just start to sort of collaborate and try to find a, a path through uh, some sort of creation of, of this musical idea that was going to come out, which we didn't know at the time. The other facilitator, Adam Ventura, uh, me and him work really well together because he he's, he he's a bit of a master in sort of harmony and in chords and, and sort of it was really great because... I was able to just allow him to deal with the sort of the harmony aspect and the chordal aspects of the music while I was able to deal with uh, the technical, make sure that everything was recorded, the rhythmic aspects, and just make sure that throughout the days we were getting everything that we needed to then be able to piece it together in the jigsaw that it was. 
So for the first day we had uh, the first group of five come in and we established a bit of an idea and that fundamentally uh, fundamental idea was a bit of a piano riff that we got and we got a rhythm which ended up being the main fundamental um, thread that defined the rhythm uh, the the song actually and the first one was a bit of a ryth rhythmic idea from a Persian Persian pop music and then there was an, an Arabic rhythm as well which was called uh, if I can remember Beladi I think it was called, which we we used as the basis to basically work the song. Then we had more people come and add to this. So by the end of the first day, we had a bit of a, a rhythmic instrumental idea. Created with those five, six musicians. Well, we had the first group of five, and then we had another group of five, and then we had a few others just sort of straggle in at different times. So we just, we, we sort of used the time to sort of build upon what we had. And that's sort of what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a rhythmic bed for the singers who were supposed to come on the next day. So that's sort of what we did. It was By the first day, it was very rough because we, we were just trying to facilitate them in ideas of, of what they could do. And I think the difference is because, for example, musicians come into the studio and some of them hadn't recorded in the studio before. So their idea of what recording is is very different to what we need. So, for example, I know, OK, I need, I need, I need this and then I need a few other pieces and, and to make it work. And then trying to communicate that to them was sometimes a little bit weird because they may be used to playing live. And then we're trying to record things and trying to record them in ways that we can then use them. Uh, like for example, recording to click, which was quite a hard thing for some of the some of them because they weren't used to that in a live format. But we needed that, and by recording to click for means recording to in a specific tempo. So then we can go back and edit that, and we sort of needed that to then be able to incorporate the singers that were coming and to be able to move things around because at that time we didn't know what we were going to get. We had so many people coming in and out of the studio that we needed to sort of be able to shift things around and, and go with the flow. So that was the first day. So we had a rough instrumental track, very rough, which we then sent out to all the singers who were supposed to come in the other day. Now, as always happens, most of the singers didn't actually hear the track the next day. And so when they came in, they lots of them didn't know what was going on, which is interesting because we also had... The other thing is we had project managers who were basically the intermediaries between us and the musicians and sort of some of the information that got through was a little bit different to, you know, the, it's like the, you know, when you're playing um, telephone, that game of telephone, you know, when you, when you say something to someone and they pass it on and they pass it on, by the time it gets to the last person, it's a totally different message. We had a bit of that going on so that when people were coming, when the singers started arriving to the session the next day, lots of them had different expectations of what was happening. They hadn't heard the track. And we ran into quite a few problems because some of them had never recorded either. So they couldn't actually record to a track, which we ended up dealing with a lot of sort of things. For example, some, some, sing, some, some artists, we just got them to record without the track and then we went and worked on it. And so there was a lot of for us to do after. Um, and it was really interesting and exciting. We had, we had beautiful artists come through and, and just do their thing in whatever way we could do it because we only had half an hour per singer because we had about 15 singers come through in a day. So we could only give them half an hour, which really is nothing when it comes to recording singers and not only that, but they have to come in, they have to feel comfortable and, and, and for a singer, it's very confronting to sing in, in front of people that you don't know, in a space they don't know and try to pull off some sort of performance, which is their best performance. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing and I think we were there trying to make them feel comfortable and trying to get what we can get in a, in a short amount of time and, and try to make it all work. We ended up getting singers coming through. We, we had a structure, so we had like another 10 to 15 singers come through, which in, included like, like a choir of sort of Vietnamese singers. We had sort of a Bosnian spoken word. We had a Persian spoken word. We had a Iranian rapper. 
we had um, some other Persian singers and we, we had Tibetan singers as well and a Tibetan spoken word that had a, uh, some poetry. So we had all these different elements that we had to somehow work over this song and we, we recorded pretty much press record and hope for the best a lot of the time. <laughs> because, and knowing that we had a lot of work to do later to make it all fit into a song. But I think by the time we got to halfway during that day, we realized we were running out of time. We just needed to get as much as we can down and do a lot of the work in the editing process. So what surprised you most about Melody of Humanity as you were creating it? I guess what surprised us most is obviously the complexity of the project. In something like this, there's only so much you can really plan for. I mean, as, I, as obviously in the examples I just gave, a lot of it depends on the performances of the people. We get sort of their, their level and as well sort of the mindset that they have coming into it. And then we just have to move with the flow and, and just try to make people feel comfortable and get the best performance at that we can and then try to work that into a song. So I think what surprises us is the complexity of trying to mix all these different cultures together. The other thing was that some some of the issues and some of the some of the, the things that we that we sort of um, had to do was also maintaining true to the culture. Obviously they the, the musicians had specific ways that they were playing things or wanted to do things but at the same time we were also trying to work it into a song which was a song which wasn't just individual performances of of specific sort of cultural songs we wanted to sort of include that into a whole musical piece so that was complex because we wanted to stay true to the traditions while at the same time collaborate, get people collaborating and open themselves up to also contributing in a way that we could produce something new. And this sort of, uh, this was about managing expectations of the musicians, but also the expectations of the project managers and, and just trying to get it work into a project, uh, a song that made sense. And yourself, I would hope. Yeah. And, you know, we have ideas of knowing what, in our head, knowing how we could make this work, but also trying to get the, get the musicians on board as well. To, it's, hard to, it's hard to explain to a musician coming into a studio for the first time who doesn't know us, who's got half an hour to perform, to, ex, to, to have trust that we're going to make him sound good or her, that we're going to do the best that we can for the song and to their cultural representation. It's hard to translate that in half an hour and to make them feel comfortable and confident in us. And, and, and I think I was surprised by how much they did trust us, one thing, and also, you know, the openness of, of, of those musicians to be able to come in and do that and, and give great performances in such a small amount of time with people they don't know in foreign, in foreign space, which was great. Um, the other surprising thing I was going to say was the, um, in that sense, the amazing sort of cultural practices and songs, instruments and approaches that we were able to, to see in the sessions. You know, one performer that, that we fell in love with was Rinchen, who, who came and, and did very traditional Tibetan singing and playing. He was able to, to put that over this Arabic rhythm seamlessly. It was, it was amazing and it was, it was great to see this sort of collaboration between these sort of Arabic rhythmic elements and this traditional Tibetan sound. It was amazing because we felt like, okay, this is, this is creating something new and it's relevant to what's happening. You have sort of these these refugees in Australia with their cultural practices, but they're, they're in Australia creating something which is relevant to here, which is this multicultural melting pot. And they're quite, they were, the fact that they were quite happy to mix these elements was, was great and um, was great to see, it was inspirational for us. Yeah, another, I guess, surprising thing was, I mean, the editing processes were also where a lot of the putting together of the work happened. And considering we had all these jigsaw puzzle bits, if you can imagine a, a table full of pieces that weren't in any shape or form at the time, by the time we finished the two days, you just had all these fragments. I think we were surprised by how many fragments we had 
it was a massive session we had. I think, in, for example, in a normal track, say, just to put into context, you'd have about, say, 40, 50 tracks of music. In a track of ours that we work on, like a very complex track, we have like 100 tracks you know, of, of individual sounds. In this, we had, I think, over 250 tracks of individual sounds that we had to somehow work into a song. And so I think being able to do that and, and working all those elements into a, into a cohesive whole was a great process for us. I mean, I, I don't think I'd, we'd worked in something so diverse like that with so many players. So it was a great experience and, and I think we were really happy with the outcome as well. Melody of Humanity exemplifies that music is an international language, as you were just mentioning. How has this concept influenced your own career playing and recording with people from so many different backgrounds? So I think the first thing in the fact that it's an international language is that uh, collaboration, which is something that I love and something that I pretty much define my career by collaborating with with different artists and I think that's where I'm at my best for sure but it's it's always about finding a common ground about being able to share your knowledge share sort of your creative approaches but then being open to something new as well I think that's sort of where I see collaboration and so I think the melody of humanity sort of exemplifies that and in my own career I've always tried to collaborate with people in a place where we're bringing our talents, but then leaving a space open, like not being, try, not being rigid or not being, um, not being stuck in a way of doing things, and just being open to allowing the session to go where it goes, and allowing new ideas to emerge, and to cre in the creation of something new, which is sort of a conglomeration of both your ideas or however many people there are and just allowing that to sort of come to fruition. I think that that sort of exemplified in Melody of Humanity and in definitely my own career as well. The other thing that has a lot to do with that is the idea of place and where you are. Uh, for example, my background is a Latin American background from my family and, and I've always been very attracted to that and influenced by that culture. But uh, being in being here in Australia, I think it's also about you know taking what I've learned through those traditions, but also making it relevant to here. So it, it always has a lot to do with with place. For example, I've seen I've seen sort of rhythms played in Latin America in 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 certain ways, and whether the same rhythm is trying to be played here, it will never be the same because we're in a, a different place, uh, different sounds, different approaches, like there's, there's differences of place and I think that's very important. I think Melody of Humanity sort of exemplifies that because you had all these refugees in this place and what they were creating, even though they were sharing their cultural expressions, was never going to be how it was in their, in their homeland. It was going to be a representation of that in this place where we are in Sydney. It was going to be something new that also took from the place that we're in. I think that's an um, important aspect. I think in um, Black Douglas, actually, who was the didgeridoo player, who in the piece of that we did, he actually talks a lot about. I've had many discussions about about the importance of place for art, and him coming from sort of an Aboriginal perspective, he always talks about how Aboriginal cultures is, is the, the the idea of place is so important because the creation of art has much to do with the place that you're in, and that the place itself has a certain type of of spirit and way of. Uh, ways of creation that come through the art. Bob Dylan says something similar when performing live in that how he got his head around playing the old songs over and over is to think of it as each performance is a different song. Yeah, well, that's interesting because if you think about it, like the sometimes we think that things can be, for example, we play the same song and we just repeat it and we sort of have this idea that it's just, it's we can repeat things, but each time you repeat a song, it's always going to be different because your experience of the song is different the place that you're in is different the audiences will be different it's no matter how much you repeat something it is going to always be different in a way um, how you experience it so i i totally agree with that 
The NOS Library Service has a musical instrument library at Ashfield, which offers a range of instruments available to borrow. The collection has been very popular with our borrowers, indicating the creative impulse is very much alive and well in the NOS community. What advice would you give to the person starting out to learn to play or make music? I would say three things, three things. And this is sort of the way I go about making music as well and how I've always learnt music. The first one is to copy. I think to be very curious about what um, those artists that you love are doing and analyse the work and try to copy the work. So whatever that style may be, uh, whether it's a pop song, uh, find the pop song that you love, the instrument that you love and try to copy the elements that you love most. And that's a way for you to learn from your favourite artist to be able to get into the music and then, for example, say you like the piano part and you're learning the chords, for example, don't be stuck with copying the chords. Like you could learn from the drummer something as well. You could learn how to put those chords into a new rhythm by studying the drums of that. Don't get caught up with try to um, copy from diverse instruments as well. Uh, so the idea of just copying to, to get you to learn is a way of learning. Then after that, I would say... Once you're, say, copying, and in this example, say we're using a pop song, then I would say learn the traditions. I think then go deeper and say, okay, I'm learning these chords from this pop song, but where do they originate? Like where's, where are the, where's this artist's influences come from? Now he may have a cultural background, you know, from certain styles, from soul music or, or from R&B or, or from gospel music. So then you may follow that into those traditions and then maybe learn the deeper aspects of that music. Now, if you can unite this with your own culture, great. You know, it means that at the same time that you're learning music, you're learning about your own roots, which is always helpful and very satisfying and would deepen music. But if you can go deeper than, than, the, than the surface as well, I would suggest that. And then finally, the final process, is the creative process, which I think is where you come up with your own versions. By that, there's many ways to do that. Some of that is is just by inventing ideas that come to your head based on what you've learned. For example, in the example of the pop song, if you've learned a certain chord progression, you may just vary it. Put chord one somewhere else and, and put two and three somewhere else and just come up with different alterations of it, change the instrumentation, or you may cut and paste from different things. You may use the chord from, you know, a, a, the bridge and put half of that chord structure in with the chord from the verse and see what happens. Cut and paste different things, change the feel. You know, if something's played on the beat, play it off the beat. Augment, subtract, add things to it, take stuff away, be, be creative with it. And that's a way to create something original. I think sometimes we think of original as having to emanate from some space, you know, some otherworldly space that's never been heard before. But I think that most originality comes from the idea of merging things together, things that that can be a very creative space, merging things that you, you may have not thought about before. And you can create very original things that way. So copy, learn the traditions or going deeper and then create, you know, Cut and paste, invent, augment, put things together that you may have thought of previously. That would be my my advice for sure. That's great advice. Oh, good. I I hope I hope it helps someone. <laughs> <laughs> we focused on your work as a writer and a producer, but you're also an accomplished performer. What's the hardest part of playing live? In performing live, I think there's two things, and I think what I've learned from the the Latin tradition, at least, is that you know, as opposed to maybe sometimes maybe the classical tradition or the sort of reading score tradition to the feeling tradition, I guess you would call it, is performing for the audience or performing for yourself. That's sort of one contrast that you can have. So performing live, I, f I find that when you're performing live, you're always performing from an audience. And that very much comes also from this, from my experience sort of in the Latin background, that you're very much feeding off the audience. And that's sometimes hard to do because you can apart from focusing on your instrument, which can be a very insular way of performing, you get a lot of benefit from moving away from that and putting as much of your 
focus on the audience. What are they doing? How are they reacting? Are they enjoying it? Are they bored? Are they dancing? All these questions can alter your performance in the moment. And so if you can get to a point in playing where you can you can move your mind from the instrument to the audience so you can encompass both the stage and the dance floor or the crowd, then I think you can make in-time decisions, in-the-moment decisions about your playing, what needs to be done. Maybe if you're in a band, you can go, okay, this song's not working, we need to move it here, or maybe let's go to the grid or let's go to the bridge now because this you know and those the difference with reading a score or being sort of trapped in your own instrument is that you don't get these cues in performing live. I guess it's kind of a uh, communal experience there then, right? Because you're playing together with a group of people and learning to hear everyone at the same time as well as yourself would take a, a lot of effort, I would imagine. Yeah, well, actually, that's the other aspect of it, listening to the, the members of the band yeah, and that would be the other aspect, listening to what every member is doing so that your part fits in as well, um, being able to adapt, for example. And, and I think this is all about in the moment because I think sometimes when you perform, you can have, like, for example, you practice, you, you go to a rehearsal and you have this idea that this is what's going to happen on stage. But I think for me, performance is, is that rehearsing, make sure you're well rehearsed. But the idea of that is so then you can shut, shut that part off and then on stage, you can just interact with the musicians. So, for example, if someone's playing something, he may not play it exactly how it was rehearsed, so he may change something in the moment, and then you can adapt, and, and, and that's how you can sort of create in the moment. A conversation even. Yeah, and I think when you're creating that conversation, I think when it's in the moment is when you're most powerful. I think, from, in my experience, it's those moments of onstage creation that are when you're most powerful musically. And so it's about managing all of that, being able to manage, um, being able to be rehearsed enough or competent enough that you can then listen to everyone, listen to the audience and create that sort of communal space like you were saying. For sure. The, um, the other thing I was going to say uh, on another topic is the idea of, because um, your question was about, playing live i think the other thing about it which maybe doesn't get apart from the actual performative aspect which doesn't get talked enough is about sort of creating a career and establishing some sort of audience or establishing an event which i think is another aspect of the performance because in order to perform you need a place to perform at you need people to perform to and you need a certain group of people to perform to as well because it's okay if you're playing rock music but you you want to play rock music to a crowd that appreciates rock music not to a classical music crowd for example you want you want to establish your audience and i think this all is about knowing sort of who that audience is and 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 finding ways to tap into that and being very proactive in establishing that 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 communication as well is is a pretty hard part about playing live because no one, I think that never sort of maybe that doesn't get mentioned enough because you're going to most musicians they go to a performance and apart from having to play competently and put on a great performance half of the worry if not more is about are people going to show up are people going to like it is the venue going to profit from it are they going to are they going to want us back because we have to make sure that these days we're also getting people to the show and everything. So that's, that's just as important as the playing these days. It's if you can put in a good show and you have all those bases covered, then it just flows from there. And it's not just about showing up and just playing. No, no, no. There's a lot more to think about these days than just that. You know, I think at least 50% of it would be, you know, that, that you're creating a, your networking your social media your all of that but also the the actual place itself that the place that you're playing at has a certain vibe or, or the space represents the music or is the best vessel for your music like if you're playing rock music do you want to play in some dingy club some underground club would be good but if you're playing rock music maybe playing in sort of some auditorium with people seated isn't like those sort of decisions have a lot to do with how people experience your music as well and they play right into how successful it's going to be as well it's very interesting 
Hmm. So, Vincent, what other projects are you working on at the moment? I know that you're working on a PhD as well at the moment. I am. That's sort of that's in its last six months. So I'm I'm right in the thick of it at the moment, trying to get that done. That's one of the projects. That's PhD is about. It looks at how ritual music is sort of translated into diasporic genres around the world. So my one looks specifically sort of at Afro-Cuban music, and it touches on areas of sort of psychology, music, anthropology, spirituality, and how the that traditional music are now appearing in sort of the diaspora around the world, and in, especially in electronic music. Um, there's a bit of a a movement going on there and so I'm interested in what the implications of that are, the impacts musically, aesthetically and also um, philosophically as well and, and, and those areas. So that's the PhD. Did we touch upon that a little bit with the group consciousness idea? Oh, the one we were just talking about? Yeah. Yeah, actually. It's, it's funny because you can see uh, I even, I, I even surprised myself because the PhD seems to come out of me now because I've spent four <laughs> years of my life on it. And it is true because I think, for example, ritual music played for ritual, and by ritual I mean sort of religious ceremony and uh, mm -hmm. in different sort of contexts is a lot, especially sort of in the Afro-Cuban context, is a lot about group participation, communal participation, and, and it's a very different idea to sort of playing on a stage and being separated from the crowd. So yes, for sure, has a lot to do with group consciousness and, and how it affects uh, all participants from the most outsider to the to the most insider, which would be the actual musician performing or, you know, the, 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 the performer of the ritual, say. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So that's, that's a deep topic right there, but we could probably talk about that for a few days. Um, the other projects I have going at the moment, uh, you, you, you mentioned before Oyobi in your introduction, and that's a, uh, my primary music project, which is, it's, a, it's three of us, um, Adam Ventura and Daniel Pliner, two other musicians. And we sort of create sort of electronica based on Latin rhythms and jazz, and we... Um, we we have an album coming out soon and we have a whole bunch of different musical projects coming out with different artists around the world which is is quite exciting for us the other project i have going at the moment as well is zook which is spelled uh, x -O, o k and that's a project i recently completed which was an online platform for interviews and discussions with artists from a whole bunch of artistic domains such as um, visual arts, dance, uh, music, film, and the discussions were based on topics spiritu as, as spirituality, culture, tradition, and art. The idea behind the Zook idea was that a lot of the time we talk to artists about art and, and practice, and I just felt that there was a spiritual element that we weren't talking to. Like in my conversations with artists, just, uh, you know, in, during performances or backstage or in recordings, I always find that artists have a have a very um, deep, I'll say spiritual practice, although it's not always defined as that. You could define it as a very deep creative practice or a cultural depth to their performance that doesn't really get explored very often, I find. And so the idea of the Zoo platform was to, to be able to explore these topics and to, to give artists the opportunity to express these things and not just for their own expression, but I think as a way to, to educate people about creativity, to open a discussion about what's, you know, what creativity is and what spirituality is and how culture you know, affects music practice and artistic practice and things like that. And so this Zook thing is now online at zook.com.au and what it is is you'll see at the moment we have... 13 interviews originally the interviews were an hour long and and we got them down to about 20 25 minutes some of them and so you see all these different interviews where we talk to artists about these diverse practices and their their approach to what they do and how they do it and their struggles and their ups and their downs and all that type of thing super interesting yeah it sounds it <laughs> and the last thing which i'll just say is um the other thing that i have running which is the the Nest, which is a, a music recording studio which we've been running for the last four years on Crown Street in Surrey Hills. 
And it's basically where I do all my work, but also it's a bit of a creative sort of music, music production and recording hub where we produce for other people. We work with different artists and we have different artists coming to record and, and we do different projects there for film and different music things. That's where we recorded the Melody of Humanity as well. And it's basically become like a little bit of a community hub now where we, um, we do our own work, do our own projects, but also we, we help other people. We, we, we invite people to collaborate and we try to create as much music and art as we can. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Vincent, for your time and for a wonderful chat. We wish you all the best in your upcoming work. Melody of Humanity is available to watch via a link with this podcast. You can also find it on YouTube. Vincent's many projects are available through his various websites, Spotify, and Bandcamp as well. Thanks again, Vincent. It was great chatting to you. Thank you so much. It's great chatting to you as well. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening and look out for upcoming digital content through the Inner West Library's What's On and social media channels.